I spoke earlier about Russia in 1900, and now I want to turn to 1905 and what's been called the First Russian Revolution. In, in 1905, Russia is faced with problems from all sides. Firstly, it's faced with an entirely unexpected threat to its status as a great power. In 1904, Russia goes to war with Japan. And the expectation from the Russian government is that this will be a quick and easy victory. The Russians are entirely dismissive uh, initially of the Japanese ability to wage war. Um, they believe that you know, their great empire will easily triumph over what they see as a minor Asiatic power. But they are astonished by the Japanese response to Russian attack. The Japanese proved to be extremely adept at waging war and they comprehensively defeat the, the Russian uh, armed forces. They defeat Russia's army on land and humiliatingly they, the Japanese succeed in sinking most of the Russian navy. Russia's navy has sailed halfway around the world from its headquarters in the Baltic Sea to the Sea of Japan uh, when the Russian Navy arrives in Japanese waters, it is promptly defeated and sunk by the Japanese. This, this then is uh, a, a threat to the very heart of the Russian state's nature. Here it is, very openly uh, humiliated on the international stage. And this yeah, sets the scene for much, much wider discontent to take hold across the Russian Empire. In January 1905, yeah, peace, a peaceful demonstration of, of working men and working women yeah, in the imperial capital of St. Petersburg, a demonstration uh, asking for quite limited uh, economic and social changes, quite limited uh, concessions to uh, working people. This demonstration is, a, is a set upon by Tsarist troops. Tsarist troops open fire on demonstrators. Hundreds of men and women are killed. Many more are seriously wounded. This became known very quickly as Bloody Sunday and it provoked immense demonstrations and strikes in sympathy across the Russian Empire. In January and February 1905, hundreds of thousands of men and women down tools and refuse uh, to work in any further. At the same time, as the spring arrives across Russia, so too does yeah, Russia's agrarian, Russia's rural population express its discontent too with the Tsarist regime. And the, the roots of rural discontent go back to the 1860s, when the serfs had been emancipated in 1861, but prosperity had not really come to the Russian countryside. Life for Russian peasant farmers was extremely tough, and that they feel under very great economic pressure in the early years of the 20th century. In the countryside then, peasants burst into inchoate rebellion. They burn down landowners' houses. They, they seize the crops from uh, their uh, noble masters. And as well as that, it, uh, discontent spreads to Russia's empire. Yeah, the national minorities, the peoples who'd been colonised by the Russian state during the 18th and 19th centuries, many of them too burst into rebellion. So in Warsaw, in, in Russian Poland, in Helsinki, in Finland, which had been part of the Russian Empire since the beginning of the 19th century, yeah, Poles and Finns take the opportunity of yeah, widespread discontent across Russia to take to the streets to protest about rule from outside. And lastly, Russia's burgeoning middle class, yeah, a middle class which has been enriched by economic change, by industrial revolution, a middle class which now has got growing numbers of lawyers, of teachers, of doctors, of agronomists, 
yeah, these men and women too yeah, express their discontent with the politics of the Russian Empire. These are people who are absolutely excluded from you know, political life. There are no political parties, there's no parliament, there's no real means by which Russia's growing middle class can exert any influence at all on the course of the Russian Empire's development. And Russia's middle class is articulate, it's vocal, yeah, they too yeah, publicise their demands for change very, very uh, widely and very loudly. So the Tsarist state then in 1905 is assailed from all sides. Yeah, there are very few people who appear to sympathise with the position of Nicholas II and, and his regime. It becomes plain to the government that yeah, they can't defeat this widespread discontent simply by the use of force, especially because there's signs of mutiny in you know, the Russian armed forces. And thus, you know, little by little, the Russian government becomes persuaded that it's got to make some sort of concessions to you know, the, the people who are protesting against it. Nicholas II is, is very, very reluctant to, to make any sort of concession to his opponents. Nicholas thinks that he is an autocratic, absolute monarch, and that he should not share his power with anybody at all. But the, the sheer scale of the crisis that, that's facing you know, him and his government in 1905 means that he has to give up some of his power. There are con limited concessions during the summer of 1905, but it's in the autumn, in October 1905, when discontent is rampant right across the empire. Strikes, demonstrations, peasant discontent, discontent and rebellion in the peripheries of the empire. And as well as that, Russia is also faced with an economic crisis. The Russian Empire has become dependent on foreign loans to keep its economy going. In the autumn of 1905, it, it needs to uh, achieve new loans from outside. But given the level of political instability in Russia, foreign banks, foreign investors are extremely reluctant to you know, lend their support to the Russian regime. And so it's not just that there's political you know, carnage across Russia, Russia is also faced with the, the, the possibility of its economy collapsing without foreign finance. And so these two pressures come together to persuade Nicholas II, you know, under pressure from Sergei Vita, previously Minister of Finance, um, the man who'd actually negotiated a peace treaty with Japan, pressure from Vita on the Tsar compels Nicholas to issue the October Manifesto in the autumn of 1905. The October Manifesto is a defining document in the history of Tsarism. For the first time, uh, it establishes an elected national parliament in the Russian Empire. Elections are going to be held on a very wide franchise indeed. All men, it, it's, it's true, but nevertheless, the majority of Russian men would for the first time be able to vote for an elected assembly to rule over them. Alongside this, this means that political parties uh, become legal for the first time during 1905. Russians are actually able to organise themselves politically and openly in ways that they've not been able to do before. And at the same time, here and, and connected with this ability to form political parties, the October Manifesto also gives individual Russians a, a wide range of civil rights. Before 1905, Russians had, had been subjects of the Russian state. They hadn't been citizens, they hadn't enjoyed you know, the rights of freedom of speech, of, of freedom of assembly, of freedom to form you know, groups and associations. The October Manifesto not only introduces for the first time a new constitutional order into the Russian Empire, 
it also promises fundamental civil freedoms for the Russian people. So then, in the autumn of 1905, it looks as if Russia has been transformed. It looks as if a revolution has taken place, leaving the Tsar, leaving Nicholas II in power as a monarch, but with, for the first time, an elected parliament that will be able to exercise influence on the way in which Russia is governed.